Hey everybody, some gadget guy here, and today we are wrapping up our long-term review on the Kyocera Brigadier. And if you caught the title of this video, I'm not joking. This is shaping up to be one of my favorite Android phones of the year. Before we get too into the review, I really want you guys thinking about what makes a phone high tech. And when we start getting really antsy about things like price and worth and value, what makes a phone a solid purchase? Now, the Brigadier's internals aren't really going to wow anyone in this day and age of super high-end flagship phones with QHD displays. We've got a 4.5-inch 720p display powered by a Qualcomm 400 series quad-core. We've got nice clicky hardware buttons down at the bottom and dual stereo speakers. We already have a speaker review that you can listen to on the Brigadier. It's nice and loud. As you can see, there is no top earpiece speaker, and we'll definitely be covering that a little bit later in the review. And the entire front face of the display is built out of sapphire crystal instead of glass. No Gorilla Glass here. This is sapphire. And not like S-A-F-F-I-R-E trademark. No, the actual gemstone sapphire, which the only thing harder than is diamond. And we already have a torture test on this screen. It broke my heart to treat any phone as roughly as I have the Kyocera Brigadier, but I have not been kind to this phone, and it's risen to every challenge that I've faced it with. Now, the Brigadier is definitely a chunky butt, but that comes with the benefit of providing a 3100 milliamp hour battery, which, if you hypermile this phone, you can easily get two day runtime out of. For a quick size comparison with a couple other phones out there, it's definitely bigger than my last rugged phone favorite, the Samsung Rugby Pro. This is a four inch screen versus the Kyocera's 4.5 inch screen. And because of the head and chin on the Kyocera, its dimensions come in a little bit larger than the Lumia 1020 and Lumia 925, which also have 4.5 inch 720p displays. For this class of devices, you're really not gonna find a larger phone until you climb up to a significantly larger screen size, to the five inch screen on the Lumia Icon, for example. In terms of general performance, Kyocera is doing a fairly terrific job of taking advantage of the horsepower that the Qualcomm 400 has to offer. I've found that performance is on par, if not slightly snappier, than the LG G3 Vigor, which I recently reviewed. Paging through home screens, dropping your notification tray, firing up your app drawer, and sliding through the different apps that you've got installed. Everything's going to function for the basics about where you think it should. Where Google and Qualcomm are going with Android, this new mid-range is more than capable of providing a fluid, sleek, fast experience for checking your email, keeping up with your social networks, sharing photos, uploading small pieces of media, Continuing our hardware tour, the top panel has a power button, a speakerphone button, so you can automatically toggle speakerphone while you're in the middle of a call, and a covered headphone jack. This doesn't quite have the same sophistication as the Galaxy S5 Active, which has a waterproofed headphone jack. You do need to keep this port cover closed if you're going to maintain waterproofing. Ditto the bottom panel, which has the covered micro USB port and a microphone. On the right side of the device, we've got the micro SD card, the SIM card slot, and a dedicated camera button. How excited am I to see a dedicated camera button on an Android phone? Props Kyocera, that's rad. And on the left side of the device, we've got the volume rocker and a customizable hardware key that you can use for just about any function or to launch any app on the phone. This does have a built-in lanyard strap, which depending on how active you are, I might actually recommend you throw the lanyard on there just so that you don't lose your phone while you're out doing all of your super cool high adventure activities. And on the back of the device is where we'll find the eight megapixel shooter capable of 1080p video and the LED flash. We've already produced a camera review on the Kyocera Brigadier, so you can definitely check out what the video quality is like off of this rugged little beast. And this is maybe where we should start our discussion on my experiences using the Kyocera Brigadier. This back panel has all of these little cutouts and edges and differing materials, and and everything about this phone, from the hardware build to some of the software customizations we're gonna look at in just a bit, screams tough. This is a tough phone. It can do tough things for tough people. If your lifestyle involves tough stuff, this phone's gonna hang with you. This is one of the only areas where I can knock that tough aesthetic. I really wish that they had built the entire phone out of this rubbery, soft, grippy plastic here that we find on the sides, as opposed to this smoother, glossier plastic that they use throughout most of the back plate. As you can see through all of the different torture tests, and every time I take this phone out in public, I pretty much show another person how unbelievably durable the screen is, but it's only taken a couple sharp rocks 
to completely scratch up this back plate. Now, as you can see where these scratches travel across the back plate, they don't seem to affect the rubbery plastic grips on the sides. When using a phone like this, you kind of start developing a chicks dig scars kind of mentality for how you throw it around. You, you just stop worrying about how rough you might be handling your phone. It's actually kind of a culture shock to go back to a flagship phone where you have to treat it a lot nicer. But in terms of how this phone will age, I really wish that this plastic weren't quite so scratch prone, especially compared to how amazingly durable the screen is. And we run into that same problem here on the sides of the device. The smoother plastic is gouged up like crazy and it shows, it's very clear and easy to see how rough this plastic has become. It's a little more difficult to see how chewed up the rubbery plastic is here down below. This build of Android is relatively unmolested. We go into settings and they do use a lighter background for settings with colors for each of the individual categories. And that's gonna be a personal preference whether or not you like that. I'm still a big fan of the hollow UI from Android 4 where all of this is sort of black with more neon-like colors. Where we really get into Kyocera's customizations are on things like their widgets for your home screen. Remember how I said everything is supposed to be tough? Well, every single widget that they've included has some kind of brushed aluminum trim in the software, which makes it look like it's rugged and metallic and ready to do battle. And all of their widgets have Dura built into them because it's durable. Even the widgets are durable for tough people who are durable people and rugged people. This is the Dura clock with weather. And this is your Dura compass and your Dura shortcuts and your Dura weather. It's a very nice consistent touch throughout all of the UI, but it does become a little silly after a point where even the software has to scream tough for tough people. Plus this mother father even has wireless charging built on the QI standard. I'm using an old Nokia charger from my Lumia 920 and you can see, boop, just turned on. It's charging via this old Nokia backplate. If you have a fat boy, if you've got any of these QI chargers, you don't even need to pop the bottom port on your Kyocera, you can just pop it on one of these pads and it's gonna start charging right up. Someone please correct me down in the comments because I couldn't think of one, but I don't think there are any Android mid-rangers that have QI charging built in. I'm just so stoked to see an Android phone at a $400 price point supporting this kind of feature. And also really happy to see that Verizon is sided with QI unlike AT&T moving over to PMA. You guys know I'm not a huge fan of top mounted power buttons because of the way that you've got to dance them around in your hand to reach this top. Even on a smaller screen, it can sometimes Sometimes be a bit of a juggle just to get in there and hit that power button. And that's why I'm a much bigger fan of throwing power buttons on the sides of devices, but the sides on this phone are already pretty well packed. So other companies like Samsung have gotten around that by having activation from the home button down here at the bottom. But hitting that home button doesn't seem to do anything. The only other quirk that we might run into is with the programmable button here on the side. Now I've left it stock, which means a long press on this programmable button will fire up the flashlight app. But if you employ any kind of security, like I use a pattern unlock, it halts the activation of the long press there. If I come in and I long press, it'll fire up the screen. And then I have to unlock the phone and then it'll fire up the flashlight app and you can see the flashlight is on now behind the phone. We can turn the flashlight off and then go home again. If you long press on the camera button, even with security enabled, it will bypass security allowing you to take a picture, but then you just can't get into anything else on the phone until you go and unlock the screen. It would be nice if the flashlight and the programmable button functioned in the same way. And speaking of the camera app, it's actually a pretty ambitious affair considering Kyocera is not really known for their imaging or multimedia creation. Like a lot of cameras, we now have one live view screen which you can easily jump between photos and videos directly from this interface. You don't have to go into camera mode or into video mode. But pulling up the settings, you can see a number of customizable features from uh, white balance to scene modes. If you wanna mess with colors, continuous shooting, panorama, you can have a smile shutter HD and they have a DSLR style defocus setting, which is very much like a lot of the other camera apps we've seen which sort of scan the background and it helps you blur the background in your shots. Plus you can get into more advanced control over brightness settings and contrast settings, how your autofocus system works, whether or not you're employing spot metering,
rendering, and we also have a software image stabilization feature. But I would also highly recommend checking out my video review on the camera as the underpowered guts, the Qualcomm 400 series processor, does run into some issues utilizing some of these features like image stabilization while shooting video. It struggles with 1080p 30 frame per second video while also employing any kind of software alteration to that video. But while that video performance suffers a little, the stills performance is actually pretty solid. And with a little patience and a little practice, you can nail some really pretty shots. It's certainly not as easy to use as other phones that we've played with in this price range, but it's not a completely hamstrung affair. I'm not entirely sure how Kyocera managed to do this, but they've found a way to make the screen a lot more responsive when water is on the display than any of the previous uh, rugged or waterproof phones that I've used in the past. And just kind of tap all these phones off a little, keep a little water on the screen, but so that they're not soaked. And we try and do something on the Galaxy, and it gets hung up, it gets really stuttery. Uh, actually, the no oh, I can't get the notification tray back up though. Oh, there we go. And kind of go through the rugby and it, it works, but it gets sort of stuck. It gets, uh, it's a little harder to get through, to see? It's a little harder to get through various home screens with any water on the screen. We come over here to the Kyocera, and while it's not perfect, it does seem to be a lot more responsive than any of these other rugged phones that I've used previously. So you can't use the uh, any capacitive screen when it's totally soaked, and you obviously wouldn't be able to use the Kyocera if it were underwater, but happily it doesn't need to be perfectly dry just to get around various elements of the UI. They've done a phenomenal job of incorporating a waterproof screen into this phone. If you guys have followed me on other videos and other podcasts, you know that I'm getting a little cranky about all phones basically just being one slab of glass over five inches in size, and they're all sort of competing for the same high-end specs. And I don't think all phone manufacturers are doing a great job of targeting specific demographics with their devices. They're all trying to make these all-rounder, one-size-fits-all solutions. And outside of a company like Samsung, who is willing to experiment with a phone like the Rugby Pro or the uh, Galaxy S4 and S5 active phones, Kyocera is really the only phone manufacturer who's making it their dedicated mission to provide rugged and waterproof phones for consumers. For people who care about survivability over the life of a two-year contract, Kyocera is a company that you should be paying more and more attention to. Remember how lit up everyone was gonna be about the iPhone 6 having a sapphire display? I thought it was a little suspect that after the iPhone 6 launched and it didn't have the sapphire crystal display, all of a sudden we saw a bunch of editorials and tech blog write-ups about why you don't need sapphire display, it's really not that good, and you know it doesn't really provide benefits and you can still break a sapphire display, so it's not indestructible, blah, 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 blah. Starting with the video torture test that I did on the Brigadier, this phone has survived so much more intentional damage than any other phone that I have tried to intentionally break. Rubbing it through rocks and dirt and sediment and concrete and resulting with a screen which is still almost factory fresh. I have actually managed to lightly scratch this screen. There is no way for me to show you that on camera. The scratches are so faint that I can only detect them in direct sunlight. And I tried with several different cameras and lenses to properly expose for the screen in direct sunlight so you could see those scratches and I was unable to show them off. Months of abuse and I have not been kind to this Kyocera. But my excitement over this phone extends beyond just the sapphire crystal. Remember how I said there is no top earpiece here on this phone? The entire screen assembly, this entire display is a vibrating membrane. So as you hold this phone up to the side of your face, it is creating its own sound, but it is also vibrating the soft tissue in your skull to provide a direct audio line into your inner ear, which means you have a much easier time listening to phone calls in challenging environments. If you need to, you can take a phone call with earplugs in. That is ridiculous. Plus, I, I can't say just how happy I am to see another phone manufacturer figure out front-facing speakers. This isn't really the most ideal position for front-facing speakers for multimedia junkies, but when you flick over into speakerphone, this thing gets even louder and the phone continues to point the audio in the right direction, namely, right into your face. No more cupping a hand behind or pointing the rear bottom of the phone towards your ear when you're taking a speaker phone call. But the durable screen, the tissue conduction, audio in the display, and these front-facing speakers are 
premier lifestyle features. This is bleeding edge technology right here. Bleeding edge technology for actually using your phone as a communications device, even if some of the other internal specs don't make it the best content creation or multimedia device. To put that in comparison, it's only about $60 more expensive than a phone like the LG G3 Vigor. Similar screen, only now we have sapphire glass, twice the amount of RAM as the Vigor, twice the amount of onboard storage, 16 gigabytes versus eight gigabytes on the Vigor, and in insanely durable housing that's also IP68 water resistant and mil spec 810G drop and shock resistant. And it just boggles the mind that if Kyocera of all companies was able to put out a $400 phone with a sapphire display and find a way to make that profitable, why couldn't Apple as a company develop something similar for the iPhone 6? Just on all points, the few criticisms that I can level at the Kyocera Brigadier are handily eclipsed by all of the amazing bleeding edge durability and communications features built into this handset. In my not so humble opinion, the Brigadier is the best mid-ranger on the market today. Maybe one of the only mid-rangers that I think is absolutely worth the asking price. And that's no small feat in a market of amazing entry-level phones and flagship phones which drop in price really, really quickly. And while I don't do scores or grades, Grades or rankings, because I think that information becomes obsolete the second you publish it. The Brigadier is easily one of my favorite smartphones of the year. And of course, I want to hear from you folks. What is it that you're excited about when you're shopping a new smartphone? Do durable and rugged phones catch your eye? And how do you balance some of that work and play aspect when you need to take your phones out on hikes or other challenging environments? Definitely drop me some comments down below because I love getting into conversations like that. As always, folks, thanks so much for watching my videos, subscribing to my channel, sharing my videos. You have been talking up a storm recently on social media and social networks and I cannot thank you enough because you're bringing all kinds of new people to uh, this YouTube channel and helping me share all of this tech goodness with you fine folks. Hit that thumbs up button and I will catch you all on the next review.